Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Kakil and welcome to the episode 100 extravaganza. The only thing extravagantic about this episode is the episode length. It's about double the thing we do usually. And with regards to a little teaser, I'll just leave it to the title and description that we have. But it was a real blast of a conversation. A lot of that has to do with my guest all the way from Portland, Oregon, here in person, Jason Langsdorf. He is the host of Learning with Jason. And as I said, we had a blast of a conversation. Check it out. I'll put all his socials in the description below. And with that being said, enjoy the episode. Beyond coding. How many, how many like in person stuff have you done usually? Because I see you stream a lot for sure. Yeah, I've done a decent amount of in person stuff, mm. but usually the in person stuff would be more like a, a panel on stage in an event, not yeah. so much like an in studio like this. So mm. I've done maybe two or three of these. Nice. And it would be like a conference kind of thing? Yeah, a lot of them are, um, you know, the we want to do a discussion about being a generalist versus a specialist. And we'll do that on stage um, yeah. as sort of a, a live podcast where it's me and the front end happy hour crew, for example. Mm. Um, or, you know, a, a discussion where it's I'll be the moderator and I've got an expert and we're we're trying to, you know, talk about the ethics of something or whatever, like the, the implications of some big change in the industry and, um, the, it, but it's usually, you know, us to an audience. Yeah. Um, so the, the studio stuff, honestly, I would do more of it if I had more people around me, I'm in yeah. Portland, so I have a decent number of folks around, but you know, it's not the same as being in San Francisco where you can just be like, Hey, why don't you come down to the office today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I mean, I wish like with the studio and everything, I love doing in-person episodes. Mm -hmm. They're just a different, different dynamic, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But it's hard to get the same amount of people as I could remote to get into mm -hmm. the studio. Basically, I got very lucky that you're like, Hey, I'm going to be around. <laughs> I jumped on that. And yeah, do, you, do you like keep an eye on who's coming through in Amsterdam and not necessarily it's, mm -hmm. it's pure coincidence. Like mm -hmm. I've had, um, uh, I forget his name. He does the cloud security podcast. Okay. Uh, he all of a sudden said, well, I'm, I'm in Amsterdam. Like we could hang out if you want. I was like, nice. let's, let's do the episode as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Cause like you, you were like, uh, I mean, do we have the setup? Like how, how are we going to do this? And right. Like, right. I got you. <laughs> 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 One of my favorite things to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I didn't know what to expect. I wasn't sure if we were coming in here to, uh, like sit in your office and you just had a couple mics or yeah. I was not expecting this no, no one is, <laughs> no one is. No. we like in jan we switched up the cameras because we mm -hmm. had different pods earlier and they were a bit more like flaky resolution wise mm. like they were good quality yeah you could just see the quality is different from these mm -hmm. and then since then i've only done remote episodes so it all to me we're in the back like this is gonna be our first day <laughs> since a while yeah yeah that's a lot of fun cool man how long have you done like uh, more so public speaking? Not necessarily YouTube and content creation, but like standing on stage and moderating stuff like that. Um, I think I gave my first talk in 2006, maybe, mm. uh, maybe 2005. Wow. And I was in a, I was in Missoula, Montana, which is a, a small town. It was, it was so small that they didn't have like a JavaScript meetup or a PHP meetup. They just had something called Montana programmers because yeah. there were only about 14 people who wrote code. And we just got together to talk about computers and code in general, but none of us used the same languages. None of us were working on the same kind of projects. And so I remember I had met one other person who was writing PHP, which is what I was kind of focusing on at the time. Yeah. And they had a question and I started answering it. And one of the organizers said, why don't you actually like give this as a talk? So at the next event, I stood up and gave a little 30 minute presentation on, I can't even remember what it was, something about how PHP worked and it was fun. Mm. Right. And so then I think in 2007, maybe yeah. I hit up Chris Coyer and asked him if I could write an article for CSS tricks. Mm. And he was like, well, I don't pay or anything. <laughs> you, I, I, I guess you can. And I said, oh, great, that's all I want. So yeah. I wrote an article for him and it went really well. It, uh, you know, I, it was right place, right time kind of thing. I was teaching people how to build their own simple PHP CMS and it hit the front page of dig and, and a few other things, which led to me getting a book deal, hmm. which led to me getting invited to speak at a, a conference called future of web design. Um, or I guess it was called future insights, the same family of conferences. It, uh, I think shuttered in 2015 or so, Okay, but they invited me out to speak, uh, 
so I like kind of had this very fortunate by putting myself out there kind of thing. I, you know, went to this little meetup of nobody (laughs) and then, uh, had fun giving a tiny talk, which led to me wanting to, you know, be out there a little bit more, which led to writing for CSS tricks and then getting a book deal with a press and then getting a, a conference presentation on the main stage of future insights. And each of those things was like, Oh, okay. I think this is what I want to do. Like yeah. I'm having fun with the coding, but I really want to teach people to code. Yeah. Um, so just kind of spiraled from there. So I love you know. the snowball there. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I've, I've gone to a few meetups. I haven't done a talk on stage like mm. as of yet, but it's something I want to do more of, or, or it seems very attractive to me. I just have a lot of hard time, I, I think, figuring out what my topic is or what I mm. really love to talk about. Cause I love the technical stuff, but I also love more of the soft skills side or the collaboration aspect of creating software. I, I feel like I, I've talked about both mm. throughout my career. I, I think my first, my first on stage talk was something about like PHP in real time. Cause I think that was what I was writing about when I got invited to speak. Yeah. And then I gave a whole talk about burnout because at, at uh, some point in 2013, I think it was, I got so stressed out run, running my agency that I had like patches of my beard fell out and mm. I, you know, I couldn't, couldn't grow a beard for four years or something. It was, wow. it was pretty rough. And I ended up, you know, selling off my agency for for a loss just to get out of it. And then I uh, went to Alaska and like unplugged from everything for a few weeks and then took two years to go travel the world and work like a single contract that paid me just enough to get by, which is really all I was after. And I worked like 10 hours a week. Yeah. Um, and th- that led to a huge kind of, I, I talked a lot about mental health and work-life balance and how to function as a, as a professional that's like, cause I'm a very ambitious person. I want to do everything, but I also realized that like when I burned out, I didn't do anything for three years. Yeah. I was, I was so fried that I, so I, now I'm kind of like, okay, Hey, you, you kids that are super ambitious and you think you can work forever. Like you're going to lose a lot more time than you think. If you're trying to burn the candle at both ends, save some time, like get a pace going because this is a long career. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a hard thing. And I see it with myself as well. The most ambitious people, the people with a high sense of responsibility and mm-hmm. accountability, those you want working together with, right? Either in right. a team or working for you if you're talking about a company. Yet those are also the people that go the extra mile and do that over and over and over again until they reach a point where they look in the mirror and have to tell themselves, I can't do that. And if this right. doesn't happen, then they hit a wall or jump off a cliff and hit into that burnout mode. Yeah. And, and the thing that, that has been so heartbreaking for me is, is I feel like it's a lesson that's really hard to learn yeah. without doing the thing that hurts. And I think this is sort of, you know, why a lot of cliches are cliches is that people don't understand a cliche until they've made the mistake that the cliche would have helped them avoid. Yeah. You know, so somebody says like, you know, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And somebody says, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then they burn out and they go, oh, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I've worked with a lot of folks. And so one of the things that, that I've, before I got out of leadership most recently, I was, uh, I was the VP of developer experience at Netlify. And one of the things that I repeated over and over and over to the people on my team was like, this stuff just isn't that important. Mm. It's not worth hurting yourself. It's not worth losing sleep. It's not worth not seeing your family. Like do the work and do the best work you can for 40 hours a week. Yeah. And then just close your computer. It doesn't matter. There's no such thing as a web development emergency. Like we don't work on critical systems. We're not doing anything that if it breaks, somebody is in in at risk of harm or anything like that. Like yeah. if the website's down, like we get a couple emails, people are like, hey, did you know your website's down? And you say, oh yeah, we're going to fix that tomorrow morning. <laughs> like, yeah. It's okay. You know, I, and, and I think that there's a sliding scale here, you know, of, of like somebody who is, is, paid to be a site reliability engineer, they've got a pager, they've got a system where they, you know, they're on rotation. It's their job right now to be available. Yeah. If you're a web developer and you're not on page duty, you why, don't have to. why are you checking your email at 9 PM? It doesn't, it's just not that important. Go be with your friends and family, go read a book, go do a project just for fun. Like, I don't care if you're still working on code, just don't do work code. Yeah. Right. And, and I, it takes a lot to, you know, you have to build a culture of that where if somebody's on Slack or, or whatever at, at 9 PM on a Friday, you gotta go yell at them. Yeah. Like, Hey, get out of here. 
What are you like, doing here? Come back on Monday. And they're like, well, I just had an idea. Great. Schedule it for Monday morning then. You know, don't don't give anybody the the impression that they should be paying attention to Slack at 9 p.m. at night. Yeah. Um, and when you work in a global team, it's hard because, you know, 9 p.m. for you is very different from 9 p.m. for me. And, you know, if I'm having an idea at what, two in the afternoon in, in Portland, it is the middle of the night for you. Yeah. Uh, and so that becomes really challenging as well to have to enforce that etiquette in a way that's like, hey, I know that like work is happening in this part of the world that you're not in. It's OK. You can look at it tomorrow. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges that I've seen going into the pandemic is that we all went global all at once. Yeah. And so our, our desire and willingness to be part of a team and especially anybody who's really ambitious and really driven is that just poured their whole selves into work. And I don't even think we've started to experience the real fallout of, no. of how burned out people are. Um, I'm just starting to see it now where people are, you know, we saw a big, a big wave of turnover right at the, when the lockdown started to ease up yeah, where the great resignation, um, in 2021. Exactly. And then we're, we're seeing like another huge shakeup in the industry. And I'm really worried we're going to see a lot of the people who were most engaged yeah. fall out of the industry entirely because yeah. of just how stressful this has all been. Yeah, I, I, I can see that as well. And I'm looking back in my own career, like I got a really good mentor and they told me like you know when you go get into kind of your first job you get a new phone you get a new laptop stuff like mm -hmm. that i was like should i get a separate phone or should i just make this my main phone and they were like no 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 i was in operations they were like you make this your separate phone because mm -hmm. the best thing you can do is put your work away right yes. whether it's in the evening whether you're on vacation just chuck your phone in a corner and that's literally what i do my phone is also now red so it's like an alarm phone <laughs> i put it away <laughs> if i don't want to look at it i i put it away and I've always done that, which meant my work-life balance was always pretty healthy. Mm. Now with lockdown, it's all kind of blurry now and it's kind of a gray area because my laptop's right there. Like my right. living room is my workspace. And then all of a sudden I'm working in the evenings. And like you said, I'm like, okay, I can I can keep doing this. This is still fine for me. Like I, I can mm. chuck in an extra few hours. I love working on the podcast. I used to do the editing myself as well. Mm. As of this episode and the previous episodes, the previous two, uh, Roald, my producer now edits, so it's it's chugging along, but I used to do a lot of work myself until I hit a point where I was like, I cannot do this. Like, mm. it's, it's too much, it's too much. I'm not spending time with my family, with my friends, with my girlfriend even, to a point where I'm like, I cannot, this is not sustainable. Right. I also wanna do more still, and I cannot do more if I don't like take care of myself first, right? Yeah, I mean, this this is a, a constant tension for me. Like, I'm, I'm feeling it right now. I'm I'm sort of on vacation right now, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm on this three week trip across Europe. Um, it's the first trip we've taken in years, you know, outside of the United States mm. and to be here, yeah. I have my laptop. Now I don't have anything that I have to do, mm -hmm. but I really want to, <laughs> right? <laughs> like I've got this, this website that I'm trying to migrate to a new framework and I'm really enjoying doing that. Yeah. I've got these ideas for things that I want to build and teach people. And I'm really excited about that. I got some workshops coming up that I want to prototype. All these things are exciting to me and I, I want to do it. And I also know how important it is to shut that part of my brain off. And, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of science about how important boredom is mm -hmm. and how important distance from work is for your ability to solve problems creatively for your ability to, you know, stay engaged in the work, right? Yeah. It's that, that, um, another cliche distance makes the heart grows fonder, mm -hmm. right? You hear that all the time and you go, yeah, yeah. But if I really love it, I'll do it all the time. And it's yeah. like, oh wait, no, hold on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and so I think, um, you know, I, I have always been somebody who, who will say to everyone, yeah, I, you know, I'm just built different. I can just work more than everybody else. And, and, mm. you know, I'm okay with that. And I've consistently proven myself wrong yeah. every time I say <laughs> that. <laughs> and yet I'll, I'll still like, I'll take that break. You know, I, I burned out so hard that I had to like completely change my life. Right. Yeah. And I still see it creeping back in where I'm like, well, I can handle a little more. I can do a little more. Like, this is fun. I'm having fun. How can this be work if I'm having fun? And yet, yeah. <laughs> right? so there it's just, go. it's, it's a, uh, it's a really tricky balance and it's a really sneaky thing when you do enjoy the thing that is your, your job, especially when your job is also what you do for fun when you're not at work. And like, at what point am I doing a hobby where I'm just kind of playing? Yeah. And when does that cross over into being like, I'm working when I'm not at work and, and 
I'm not sure. Like if I start doing a, a music project where I'm working with MIDI, now that's still computer work. Yeah. Is that work work? I don't think so. If I start building a, a visualizer for it, now I'm writing code. Is that work work? Mm. I don't know. Right. Yeah. And and there's a point where I'm like, okay, well now I want to build a website for my, my visualizer so that I can do music. I'm like, okay, now I'm just working. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and I really don't know how to, how to draw those lines. So uh -huh. what I'm trying to do now is, um, I've gone independent as of the, the beginning of 2023. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a full-time educator and media creator for, uh, I'm working with companies to help them you know, build better media around developer education and around just kind of communicating what their products do. So I'm trying to take a lot of those projects that I would have done for fun, like, oh, I'm, uh, an audio visualizer, yeah. right? Can I work with a company that would be part of that stack and make that my day job mm. so that I can do it within the 40 hours a week that I want to work and not feel like I have to, you know, carve time out to sneak in fun. I, can I make the fun what I do for work? And yeah. so far I've been reasonably successful at this. Like, I don't feel like I build a lot of things that I'm not having fun building. I think the tricky part is how do you expand that to be the things that you don't really know how to make them work, mm. right? Like I want to make music. Nobody's going to hire me to be a music producer. I'm not very good at it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so in the meantime, how can I find little ways to work music in that allow me to, you know, play and grow there, yeah. but that aren't the core of the work exactly. Um, so that I'm still providing something valuable and not just trying to get somebody to pay me for playtime. Yeah. Like a creative outlet in that aspect. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and I do think that that's sort of what makes somebody valuable as a creator is that you, you, you don't watch somebody specifically for like the thing they're teaching. You usually, you find creators that you like the way they think, you like the way they approach things, you like the, you know, the, their outlook on the world, right? Mm. That's why some of us are really into something like Bob Ross and others are, are watching something completely different. And both of those things might be teaching you how to paint, Yeah, but somebody wants the, the no nonsense, super tactical, and somebody else wants the really like lighthearted. It's not that big of a deal. You know, the Bob Ross ASMR thing. Yeah. More personal. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and I think there's a, you know, it's the same if you watch some of the creators in the dev space right now, you've got somebody like Kenzie Dodds, who is, who's very like calm and, and proactive and, and like very kind of measured in the way they do it. And then you've got folks like, you know, Theo or the Primogen who are like mm. not measured. They're super sensational and they want to tell you why their thing is the best thing. And, and neither of them are wrong. Nobody's, yeah. nobody's incorrect. It's just a flavor, right? Exactly. Like I, I want my information to be more engaging and more like, I want to be thinking about, oh, this could change the world. Or I want to be thinking about this as it's a tool. It's a tool. And I don't, it, like none of them matter. I'm here to do some work, yeah. you know, and, and you can kind of choose who you watch for that. And what I think makes any of these folks interesting mm. and, and what I hope makes me interesting is that we're bringing our own stuff to it. So, you know, when you watch me, I'm usually bringing in food analogies. I'm usually talking a little bit about my past experience as a performer, as a, as you know, a creative outside of tech and each of those things that I'm bringing in makes my stuff a little different. Yeah. You know, you're, you're not seeing exactly the same thing. Even if I'm teaching React and Kent is teaching React and the Primogen's teaching React and Anya Kubo and, and whoever else is teaching React, each one of us is bringing something that you've never seen from the others yeah. and that you probably never will. You know, like you, you just, you know that that person is themselves. They're bringing a whole person there. Yeah. And so I think there's, there's a lot of value in really steering into the parts of, of yourself as a professional that aren't the actual skill set, Because mm. that's where you start to get this interesting cross pollination of, of not just like what I know with the tool, but what I know about the world yep. and how I can make that, you know, uniquely interesting or come up with a unique analogy that helps somebody connect the dots and the light bulb goes on, um, or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, it makes me think back of when I used to work in a team that was with people from a lot of different backgrounds and cultures, not mm. necessarily they, they didn't study software development. I didn't so study uh, computer science in that aspect. They were from all over the place. And I learned the most, not necessarily on a technical level, but also just on an interpersonal level, right? Because they could leverage what they had. They could exactly, as you say, leverage their experience in explaining it just mm. it's slightly differently. So I would always remember those things. And I think it adds to whatever you're doing. People are looking for authenticity, integrity in whatever they're doing, whomever they're collaborating with, working with, mm. or even watching and consuming content from, basically. Right. And yeah, I think 
I like that it's getting more and more to the forefront because usually people used to take a product and that will be that, right? I would buy a glass. Now I care about where this glass comes from, who right. made it, right? The authenticity part of it. Mm -hmm. And it makes me happier knowing the background of that part of the production while I'm enjoying whatever I'm doing, basically. Yeah. I <laughs> Authenticity is one of those things that I, I think about a lot mm. um, because it's, it's ultimately a completely made up concept, yeah. right? Like what, why do we care if a paintbrush was held by Picasso versus somebody who does a, a stroke for stroke, perfect imitation of that same painting? We do care, yeah. but there's no, there's no difference. No. The difference is just sort of imagined. Right. And so, so I think about like, what does make something authentic other than just bringing your own, like bringing the fullest form of yourself to whatever it is you're creating. Mm. And I think that's, that kind of goes back to what I was saying about trying to be more than just the tools you're teaching or the, the subject matter that you're trying to, to be an expert in. Cause you know, it's anybody can go to the docs and read the API yeah. or can go to the Wikipedia page and read the history. What they can't do is they can't take, you know, my background in, in music and writing, and they can't take Shonda person's background that makes her one of the best analogists I've ever heard. Like she comes up with these incre incredible, like, well, if you think about react, it's, it's, it, she'll tell a story yeah. and you just, and it just makes sense and it's perfect. And you know, that makes her incredibly special as an educator, uh, in the same way that, that each one of these educators kind of has their thing. If you, if you look into who's really successful, the West bosses and the Sarah Drasners and the Cassie Evans in the space, each one of them is sort of like known for a thing mm. and, and sort of an approach in the way that they break information down. And, and if one of them is not your preferred style, yeah, somebody else in the space is probably teaching it a little bit differently and they're bringing in their own background and their own history. And that's what makes it approachable. That's what makes it fun to learn from them is that you find some common ground, some overlap with this person. You say, Oh, they're like me. I can learn from them. Yeah. Right. And, and you have to have a lot of different creators and educators in order to have enough people find that overlap and feel like they can see themselves in this industry. And I think that's such a magical thing. And it just wouldn't be there if everybody felt like they had to be a robot and just yeah, and get the exactly thing. the content, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's interesting because I've, I've never looked at content creation from that aspect, yet I do recognize what you say. And even looking back in the teams I've been, mm. those relationships and those kind of interpersonal <clears throat> connections, what I have with someone and the way they explain something or the way they interact with me, I think those are the most fondest memories I have of like, a learning journey because I, I started out, I didn't know anything of software development. I came from operations. It was very obvious that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And even in operations, I didn't know anything because I came from uni and they don't teach you anything about operations, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I had to make a list of acronyms because in tech, people love acronyms. Um, but those extra hours, those, I mean, even office hours where people really took the time and effort to explain it and to keep explaining it. Even if I would tell them I got it, they could see I didn't get it. And they would just <laughs> go over and over and over again. And I, I just really appreciate that aspect of it. Absolutely. And I think you, you need that with whomever you're working also. Yes. Yeah. 100%. It's a, uh, I mean, I've never thought of my career like that, but I think those interpersonal relationships it's interesting because people always say that, right? You remember your relationships with people, not necessarily even what you were doing. Like I have snippets and fragments of memories of the things that I have done, but none of them matter in comparison to the relationships that I've built. And I'm also right. a person that is horrible in keeping relationships. It's something <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to improve when people say like, let's keep in touch. I'm like, please put in the extra effort because I suck at it basically. <laughs> <laughs> and people luckily do. Uh, but the relationships really matter at the end of the day. I think it's yeah. it's important and probably for me, it might be the most important in wherever I'm working is who I'm working with. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I have a few things that I'm trying to optimize for in, in any given situation. And, and forgive me because I'm about to go on a wild. <laughs> um, but so the 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 biggest thing that I'm looking for in any job is what, what do I stand to learn? Yeah. And typically what I'm evaluating is like, who is there that I can learn from? Not necessarily what am I going to be doing? Because, yeah. you know, when I, when I took my job at IBM, I wasn't really taking that job so that I could go to IBM and learn what IBM does. I, I took that job because the manager that hired me in, uh, Robin Cannon was a 
fantastic person who was a very good people leader. Yeah. Right. And I wanted to see how that worked. How do you work on software in a team, in a functional team? And I knew that Robin could show me that. Um, and when I went to, to Netlify, I wasn't even planning on joining Netlify, but Sarah Drasner hit me up and said, do you want to come work in Netlify? I was like, there's no chance I'm going to pass up an opportunity to learn from Sarah Drasner. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that, that makes a huge impact on where I'll choose to be. And then I think the, the other things that I've found to be really important in my career, at least, is thinking about the, um, the type of work hmm. that you're doing and the, the scale of the organization. Cause these are things that I, I didn't know when I was first getting into, to the workforce in general, uh, but that have turned out to be like the most important things for me when considering what I'm doing next. So the, the first thing being the type of work, um, there's a, a spectrum of work that Simon Wardley, uh, who he's, he's in the like planning space kind of like he's, he's talked at a bunch of, of conferences and I've seen him a couple of times. And one of the concepts, the concepts that he brought up is this idea of the spectrum of styles of work yeah. going from what he calls pioneers, uh, in the middle, there are town settlers and on the, the other end there's city planners, which, uh, you know, pioneers are sort of like generative start from zero, uh, you know, go into a problem space that hasn't been defined and there's not really a product and we're not really sure. We just, we think there's potential here. Right. So it's more R and D more chaos driven. Yeah. Um, and then in the middle with, with town settlers, it's, it's somebody who wants to take a prod, a problem that's sort of been defined. Like, Hey, we know, uh, that people are willing to pay for this. And we know that like this sort of works, but we don't really have a business. We don't have a product, right? Mm -hmm. So a town settler is the person who's going to take that, that seed of an idea and build it into something sustainable that that's going to move on. Yeah. And then on the city planner side, you've got somebody who's going to like take a running system and just make it perfect. They want to fine tune the machine. They, they're going to make sure that it never goes down, that all the edge cases are covered, that it's completely polished, that they've got contingencies for their contingencies. You know, somebody who's really into like SRE or, or DevOps or, or like keeping something running. Yeah. Resilience. Right? Yeah. Resilience and, and all those things that just go into making things really operate at the biggest scales with the, the most chaotic inputs, you know, they're like, no, this is rock solid. Yeah. And each of us falls somewhere on a spectrum between these three places, right? Mm. And I, I think that for me personally, I'm much more on the pioneer side. Okay. The more I spend doing maintenance tasks, the more I start to get kind of antsy mm. in my job. And so if I get pushed toward like, okay, you've, you've done all the work to think about what it could be. Now you got to keep it running. And I start kind of going, oh, but we could, maybe we should re re-engineer the whole system. Maybe we should start from scratch, right? I'm the one who starts getting antsy and proposing a full rewrite. And yeah. that's super destructive on a team, right? But it's because I was in the wrong role. Yeah. Uh, so now I've started optimizing for more of these pioneer things. Like I effectively think of myself as an R and D engineer. Mm. I will be very good if you throw me into a situation and tell me what the problems are, like what pain point are, are what pain points are your customers feeling? What pain points are your team feeling? Um, what, you know, what do you think you want to solve? And I'll just start brainstorming, coming up with ideas and work with the team to, you know, put together some plans, some things to validate. Yeah. Once we validated the ideas, I want to move on and do something different, right? Mm -hmm. I want to hand it to a town settler and then, and then continue on my next big chaotic task. Um, and so then that brings me to the, the second piece of my giant tangent, sorry, <laughs> no uh, which is thinking about the scale of the organization. organization. And so at, you know, the really small sizes, when a company is 10 people, 20 people, you can have these very chaos driven roles where you get hired and you don't really have a job title yet. Mm. You just, you're there to help make the company function. Yeah. So when I first joined Gatsby, I was, you know, in, within the first like 10 or 15 employees, I think number 12, and they didn't have a job title for me. So I just started referring to my role as human duct tape yeah. because whenever there was an issue, if nobody else was like, oh, this is my domain. I was kind of like, okay, I'll figure it out. I'll do we'll it. We'll see how it works. Yeah. And this is how I started my career. I actually, uh, I got into web development in the first place through being a musician hmm. and we didn't make enough money to hire a design agency or a web agency. So I just said, I'd figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And so I, I got into designing merch and designing the website and I customized our MySpace page and I learned flash so that I could embed music in the page, all these different things. And I never thought of myself as a, as an engineer or as a designer. Yeah. I was a musician who was just couldn't afford to hire help. 
Hmm. Right. But I built this whole career out of uh, that sort of, here's an undefined space. We need to figure out how to get posters to, you know, some teenagers in Phoenix so that they can tell people we're coming. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know, I'll figure it out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and so at a small company, it's real, they're really well suited for that type of approach. Like, yeah. okay, we just figured out that there's a boot camp that's over here, but we have no idea what to do with them. I'm like, cool, I'll figure it out. And we'll I started putting together like a, you know, a program for, yeah, wh what's our, our DevRel program? I wasn't a, I wasn't in developer relations when I joined Gatsby. I sort of moved there because I realized that that was the place that I could provide the most value. Hmm. And so I started putting together programs to thank, get contributors and, and figure out how to get the community activated and create spaces for people to talk to each other and share code and all that kind of stuff. That's how Learn With Jason came about in the first place is I was like, well, how can I like teach people more about how to use this stuff? And oh, great. Well, here's a format. Yeah. Um, and then as Gatsby grew, I mean, Gatsby, I left because it was more of like dysfunctional leadership. But when sure. I joined Netlify, Netlify was 75 hmm. and it was still at that phase where it was small enough that you could do a big generative project. There was a, an unknown thing and you could just say, okay, I got an idea. Can I get like these teams to get into a meeting? And, you know, we'd meet and decide that it was the right thing to do. And we do something wild. Yeah. Uh, but by the time I got to the end of my career at Netlify, they were at 300 and you just can't do that anymore. When I start proposing a big project like that, everybody's stressed out. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm like, oh well, what if we just pull together the right people for a week and we all work on this thing and get it done? And you know, I'll need like a couple people from these twelve teams, and all the leadership is like, that's exactly what we need to do. And all the managers are like, I cannot afford to lose those resources for a week. Yeah, right. So I'm like getting leadership into a worked up, which is yanking the roadmap, which is stressing out the managers, which is causing the ICs to feel like they're not sure if they should listen to the manager or listen to me. <laughs> chaos. And I just realized I was like, God, I'm like, I am the chaos agent. I am causing mm. stress to this team. Mm. So I need to be in a, in a chaos driven role. So smaller teams, earlier stage projects, and, and that's where I'm best suited to be. And I think for each of us, if we take the time to start thinking through, like, when have I been the most effective? When am I the least effective? When have I caused more harm than good, more good than harm? And what were the common pieces of the organizations I was in? Did I have small team, a big team? Did I have a great manager, no manager? Was I working on something established or generative? You know, where, where do I make the best impact? Mm -hmm. And consider it on these, these vectors, and you can really start to get a good map that lets you make good choices about where you should be in your career. And, and this is sort of, uh, it's, it's the sort of thing that like, I've had a, a theory that is similar to this mm. for the last 10 years. Okay. And it kind of, it refines over time. And each time I join a new company, I make different decisions. And, and so, um, you know, what I would have told you 10 years ago would be analogous to what I'm saying right now, but I, I lack 10 years of experience that have led me make better choices for me. Of course. Um, but I do think that, you know, for, for everybody, there's, there are some things that like really sit as your core values. If yeah. you, if you start to think about what makes you happy, what drains your energy, when you do this work, you need a day to recover, or you want to just keep going forever because you enjoy it so much. And if we can get a map of that and what the conditions are that let us do that work, we can kind of optimize our careers in a way that, oh, well, I know that this company is starting to grow toward the size where I'm not going to be effective anymore. So I should start thinking about making myself redundant yeah. so that I can leave on good terms instead of like having to pull the ripcord and, Oh, bye everybody. I'm clearly causing damage. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> um, and I, and that's, that is sort of what I was able to do. I hope at Netlify where when I left, I don't think the team was left with a big hole yeah. because I had worked really hard to try to make myself not central to the pieces of things that I was doing because I saw the end coming. Yeah. Like I knew that the company was getting too big for me to continue to be effective there. Um, but it, I, sorry that, so that was a really long tangent. <laughs> no, I don't no even worries. know if we're still talking about the same thing. No anymore. worries. I, it's interesting, right? Because I've been in a lot of organizations. I mean, I'm, I'm working at CBA. It's a consultancy company. Mm -hmm. So I, I get to be in a lot of different environments and I get to pinpoint where I felt like I was most effective and what I haven't done yet, because you have 10 years of experience. You have even more. I don't even have 10. So I'm still mm -hmm. trying to figure out like, where, where am I most effective, right? Where is my value in that? And I've joined a lot of products and companies where they were already at one, right? They just went live. We were building new features to add value on top of. Mm. I've, I've joined where 
it was already past that phase where we were building new features, but we were A-B testing them. So not even releasing them, mm -hmm. but more so researching and optimizing what we already had, right? right? Because we had reduced capacity, reduced budget. And now I'm in a, um, a phase where I'm building a product from zero to one. Mm -hmm. And I've never done that. And I was really excited because I was like, okay, how does this work? And how do you make those decisions? And how do you document for, because I have that future perspective, looking right. back, why decisions were made the way they were. And now the chaos that I'm in, I'm like, okay, this, these things usually slip through the cracks. So that, that is then what I focus on, but I'm still trying to figure out work-wise, where do I add the most value? And what is also like my sweet spot, my comfort zone, and where do I want to grow in? Mm -hmm. Because they all have different facets and different mindsets to be effective and for you to optimize kind of that work way uh, and process in there. Organization wise, I don't know yet because I've, I look to myself and I've always been kind of entrepreneurial in trying to get done what I need to get done or what I think is best for the company is yeah. probably better. Uh, and I always have that kind of collaboration aspect in the back of my mind. Like I've been in teams where people are like, okay, I'm here for me. Uh, yeah. And that's really hard to work together with. Yeah. And at some point it becomes obvious as well but I'm never that person. So I also haven't realized where if I'm really trying to get done what I think is best for the company and I'm destructive as byproduct of that, I've never had that realization. Mm. Like, I think that's a hard one because you very much pinpointed like the effects of what you were trying to cause and you were doing it because you thought that would add value, right? You right. could create something from zero to one again within that bigger organization, mm -hmm. but because of the established patterns there and obviously resource allocation and people already being kind of less in innovation and more in kind of standardization. That was chaos for them because they were like, what's going on here? We're not going to do the same thing today instead of yeah, like and, usual. And so much of it comes in too with, with understanding how to navigate the, mm. I'm going to say politics, but I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean yeah. that in the, the interpersonal relationships way of how a company functions, because if, you know, it, with a healthy company mm. where everybody's talking to everybody at every level and there's a lot of communication and a lot of context and clarity of what the goals are, what the vision are, what the expectations are, you can be a little more agile at any size. Yeah. The problem is, is that keeping context and clarity high as a company grows beyond, I think there's a, this famous number, the Dunbar number, which I believe is 250, mm. which is like the number of people that you can actually know. Yeah before you, they just become like a reference, like a number on a spreadsheet or something. And once you cross beyond that line, it's really difficult not to take shortcuts. Mm. And so I've watched leaders that were really, really good at small groups yeah. and they would take everybody into account and they would, you know, hold big town halls and they would always share context and they would let everybody know what was going on. They start crossing that number. They get up above 200, 300 and out of necessity because they can't spend, you know, 24 hours a day in town halls trying yeah. to explain everything to everybody. They start taking shortcuts. Mm. And so they'll write a doc and the doc is missing a ton of context because nobody can write with perfect clarity exactly what they want done. Yeah. And then they can't afford to do the town halls anymore because they have to optimize for, for movement. Yeah. Right. And when you've got 250 people, 300 people all asking questions and not being clear on things, you you'll find that the whole process bogs down to just complete inability to function because no one's ever going to be happy. Mm. And this is one of the things that gets really hard as a, as in leadership is like, I, there's a point that you cross with a, a sufficiently large team where you're no longer like doing the right thing. Yeah. You're trying to do the least wrong thing. Right. And you, you're no longer not doing harm. You're trying to do the least amount of harm. Yeah. Because you're all like you, you get people who have completely opposed views, right? You've got the, the sales team who's completely dependent on new features because their entire income or 80% of their income is based on commission. Yeah. Right. So they need you to make something that they can go out and sell. And they've exhausted the pool of people who are willing to buy the thing that you have right now. So yeah. they need a new thing. And then you've got a product team, engineers, who are really spread thin. They're really worried about tech debt. They're really worried about, like, if we don't start fixing some of these, these rough edges, we're going to have some real problems in the future. Yeah. And you're like, okay, but if we don't ship features, right? So if we don't fix this, we're going to have problems. If we don't ship features, we're going to have problems. I have to make all of you a little bit unhappy right now. Yeah. Right? And And how do you find that balance where you're not doing what I think some leaders do, which is where they just say, 
figure it out. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and they kind of make it everybody else's problem. And, and this is, again, you make an optimization, you go, okay, look, I hired smart people. Y'all can figure this out. And you just say, look, figure out how to do maintenance work and features. Yeah. And in theory, that's possible. But when you don't have that really high trust, high context, high clarity, at what point is the manager doing too much to put that maintenance work in alongside the features? At what point is sales pushing too hard on engineering and product to to release new features over like letting them be functional as a team? Who's drawn that line? Who yeah. makes that call in a in a disagreement? Who's the mediator? Right. And what you would say is, well, it's leadership. But if leadership is a is committee, mm. do they like does the the chief sales officer and the chief product officer do they, do they agree? battle it out? Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and and because the the product officer is going to say do what I say, and the sales officer is going to say do what I say, yeah. and and now you need like a CEO to mediate, and they don't have time. <laughs> They're like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> like, why do, why are you bringing this to me? Your like that your job is to figure this out, yeah. and and the problem is that none of them have enough context. Mm-hmm. Like the CEO only has the high level business context. The sales officer is clearly focused on keeping the sales team healthy and they're their people going to battle for their people product. Same going to battle for their people and they just need different things. So they're, everybody's going to lose. Yeah. Right. And, and that is the part that's really, really hard about big organizations is it. And when I realized that I got super depressed, (laughs) (laughs) Damn, (laughs) I was like, Oh, so you can't have like this big, happy, no, organization. You can't work in a company where everybody's always stoked all the time. You're always going to have disagreement. You're always going to have misalignment. As soon as two people walk away from each other, they start drifting on what their understanding is Mm. of, of things. So, you know, the last moment they spoke plus however many seconds, that's how out of alignment they are now. Yeah. Right. (laughs) And, and it doesn't like, they could be perfectly in agreement with each other. If they're not constantly sinking, and you just can't do that when you've got 200 people. You can't have 200 people syncing with each other constantly because no. you'll never get any work done. No, exactly. And then everybody complains about meeting culture, so you cut back meetings, but then nobody's talking. So everything is starting running off in opposite directions and nothing's compatible anymore. And you're like, oh my God, this is this is an unsolvable problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So in my case, I just waved the white flag and, and I was like, I got to get out of I'm this. Out. I can't do this scale of organization anymore because I like... I just, I didn't sleep anymore. Mm. Like I just had this constant knot of stress where I was like, I am letting everyone down. I am screwing this up constantly. Like I'm going to be the reason that somebody burns out of this industry and I cannot live with that. No. Um, so, you know, the, maybe the right thing to do would have been learn more about leadership. But what I did was I was like, I'm just going to go back to making YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> That's insane. Like, it's interesting because I've recently taken up a coach. Like I've had a really good conversation with someone about like my, my personal journey, my career journey at this company, Exivia. And they were like, if you want, like I can, we can have this on a more regular basis. Cause I told mm. them like, I really don't have, like I have a mentor, but I'm, I'm really lacking kind of a coaching aspect. And he comes from a behavioral science background. Mm. So he was like, uh, I'll give you some advice, which I think might be helpful. Cause he, he heard out where, where I had problems or where I had struggles with. Uh, and he's like, you are a person that has a lot of relationships, but you can learn how to leverage those as well, more strategically, because then you mm-hmm. can understand your place in the organization, what is exactly going on, right? If sales is pushing feature development and product is pushing back because the, they cannot with where they are now, that you can then kind of refine for yourself and you can more so understand what is happening within an organization, right? And if you then want to put yourself into a position where you're trying to solve that because you think it's an organizational problem mm. that needs to be solved, then that's the next question. Because I find myself always in a position of, do I really like the thing that I'm doing or do I do it because I think it's necessary for my team, for my organization, because it's the best thing that needs to be done. Right. And I still sometimes struggle with that because I, I genuinely enjoy doing a lot. I'm a person that enjoys more than they don't enjoy, basically. Mm. So then I'm like, okay, are, am I doing this for me or am I doing this because I think this is the right thing to do? Mm. And I don't think there needs to be a black and white answer either because everything is experience anyway. Right. So when I feel like, okay, people are literally not hearing me right now and I'm talking to someone and they see me as a resource or a number, they're operating on that scale of like, I don't know everyone and I'm right. trying to mitigate damage here. Right. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm at the damage side. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> And we're having that dialogue and I can really see they're not understanding me 
then I'm like, okay, this this conversation, I'm sorry, but it is useless. I'll go to mm. someone else. I'll drag in more people to gain a better understanding, right? Because one of the things that I'm, I'm happy you mentioned it, one of the things that is really going to help and it's going to be detrimental is clarity mm. and transparency with information. Yes. Because somehow if things don't make sense, if people start doing weird things, then there's a really good reason why they're chaotic and where they're doing this weird thing it's because they're stressed because some things are not going as as they wanted to it's because people are pushing back they're having confrontations they're not comfortable with this mm -hmm. so then you can see this weird behavior and when you're trying to strategically pinpoint where it comes from it helps when you have that information yeah I, like. i've never been in a company where somebody was actively sabotaging no. like I, I sometimes i think that you know you when you're in a specialty yeah it's it's tempting to look at everybody around you and say, well, they just don't want us to get good work done. Yeah. And you, can, them. you can start to make this sort of villain story of like, oh, well, it's all marketing's fault. It's all product's fault. It's all leadership's fault. And the, the unfortunate reality is, is that everybody's doing the best they can given the information they have. Yeah. So everybody's operating on limited context, you know, so we've got this series of overlapping windows where each team, each organization has a, a different piece of the, like smaller piece of the overall puzzle. And they're making decisions that they think will lead the company to the best outcome. Yeah. And a lot of times you just don't know when you're in sales or when you're in marketing, what a decision that really helps marketing causes in terms of, of, you know, roadmap whiplash or, or whatever. Yeah for engineering or what a decision in engineering might cause for the reliability team, right? Even if it's like, it can be within the same general organization, everybody's in engineering, the front end team wants to do this thing. Mm. And then they didn't talk to the reliability team and they go, no, 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 you can't. We, <laughs> we don't have enough people to stay up overnight to deal with whatever that nonsense is. Right. Yeah. And so then it sounds like they're just saying no. And if they don't talk, mm. right. And, and, you know, again, each decision is hitting every single organization in the company. Like when I make a decision, it's influencing tech debt or not. It's influencing sales or, or you know, causing problems for sales. It's influencing our ability to communicate to our customers, whether that's marketing, whether that's documentation, whatever it is, right? Each of these decisions from each level of the company is going to impact every other organization in some small way or a major way, depending on what it is. Yeah. But we usually don't have the time no. to really sit down and map each of those decisions out. And, and this is one of those things that I think is so hard because companies, what they should do is really, really focus down on one or two things that they could all talk about and align on. Mm. But that's way too hard to do. Yeah. If they start doing it, everybody gets frustrated and burned out. People stop paying attention. Like a team breaks off and starts doing whatever they want. So like, oh, they're just going to be in planning for months. So let's just play over here. And then they just break apart and they do whatever they want. But if, if we could, if yeah. we could maintain focus, if we could stay as a unit, as an entire company on one or two things where we keep that high focus, we execute very, very quickly. Yeah. And you see this every once in a while where a company just finds this groove, right? Like we, we've we seen, um, like GitHub did this a couple of years ago where it was like all of a sudden they were launching new features every week. They were just absolutely killing it. And this is a huge team. Yeah. How? How Incredible. did they do that? I don't know. They they found alignment for a, a brief moment in time where they were just like, boom, 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 boom. Um, and I, I want every company to be able to figure out what that is. Yeah, right. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm like, okay, well, if you really want to be that fast, you just don't hire more than 15 people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, a bigger team causes team problems, right? But what what I see and what I usually shut down is when people make it personal. They're like, this is just mm. a bad person, right? Or my manager just, he's an awful human being. And I'm like, listen, they're not, right? They're trying to do the best they can. They don't have the information. Maybe they've never been a manager. Maybe they're really uncomfortable in this position. They're not a bad person. Like if it gets to that point, that can spiral real quick. And right. I try and shut that down <laughs> immediately. Yeah. I, like, I mean, oh, you're probably right. I've been in this industry for 20 years yeah. and I've met two people out of the hundreds that I've worked with that yeah. were actually like bad people. You'll have exceptions. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but it, that's the exception that proves the rule. Yeah. Everybody else, like even people that I thought when I first met them, I was like, oh, you're a monster. <laughs> yeah. Right? Damn. And then you, you finally get that meeting where you like really talk to them and you understand where they're coming from. And you're like, oh, all of your incentives are, are out of alignment with what we need to do. Yeah. You know, that's the other problem too, is, is when you start getting into big organizations, 
we all want to own a metric, mm. right? We all want something that is like, we own this, we influence this. And the problem is, is that in, in the pursuit of getting something individually ownable, yeah. we come up with things that don't matter nope. that directly compete with each other. Like one of the things that, so I, I come from developer experience. Uh, what are we responsible for? Mm. Right. Well, we're responsible for more people getting interested in trying and hopefully like trying lots of things within the product. Yeah. That's my entire function as a, a developer relations engineer. But <laughs> product is also responsible for, so, so to put names on those metrics, it would be like active users or active developers and actual activation. How many features of the product are they using and are they returning versus like they try it once and bail. Yeah. Longevity. So I'm, I'm looking at, at active users and activation as sort of a broad metric of, of long-term usage. Hmm. So I should own that in developer relations, but product also influences whether or not somebody stays activated Yeah, and marketing influences whether or not somebody is an active user, whether they sign up. Right. Yeah. So each of those things is kind of co-owned. Mm. And so I've seen companies try to over optimize where they start saying, okay, well, developer relations, you own blog views. Okay. And it's like, but why? Yeah. Well, because if a lot of people are reading our blogs then they'll, they'll sign up, but we can measure you mm. on whether or not you get blog views. I'm like, cool, but I could do Buzzfeed style articles about Kim Kardashian and get millions of views and no one will sign up no. for our product. It doesn't matter. So why am I like, why are we measuring on this? It's, it's not the right thing. We need to be measuring on active users and signups. They're like, well, we can't attribute. Mm. Don't worry about attribution. Worry about trends. Yeah. Like we're a team. We're one company. We're exactly. One team, we're right? doing this together. But the bigger a team gets, you can't like, okay, so now we say that, but we're 500 people now. Yeah. What's your contribution? Active users are going down. Yeah. Who's head rolls? Yeah. Do we just fire all of marketing and, and <laughs> developer experience at <laughs> exactly. the same time? Because at, no, of course not. Right. Yeah. So you have to look for where the problem is. So you start going like, like, deeper and deeper metrics that get less and less meaningful so that you can get accountability. But the accountability is not meaningful because it's for metrics that don't matter. And everybody knows that. So they kind of have this like back channel of like, well, don't worry about the metric so much, worry about this other thing. And it's like, how do we function at all? Yeah. How do we get anything done? No. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's tricky. It's very, very tricky. And, and ultimately this is why I've, I've really gravitated towards smaller teams is because when it's, you know, under 50 people, you can just look at active users. And if yeah. something's going wrong, we all know who didn't do their job. There's only 50 of us. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's overseeable. <laughs> exactly. Interesting. Like I've, I felt that not on an organizational level, but more on a personal level in performance reviews, for example, they were mm. like, well, for next year, mm -hmm. these outputs could be your focus. Two blog posts, two, two times standing on stage, like all these numbers where I'm like, Listen, if I could, if I could really focus on this, I'll have it done in two months. Like, mm -hmm. am I then going to wait a year for a performance review? Like, this is not what I want to focus on because firstly, I don't even like some of the stuff that's in there. That's on a more personal level. Right. But secondly, if there's an opportunity that comes by and it's really exciting to me, do you want me to pass it up because I'm focusing on some KPIs and some metrics? Or do you want me to be the judge, right? That's why you hired me mm -hmm. to think and be like, okay, I think this is more valuable than what I, whatever I'm focusing on next, right? right? It's input versus output like those kpis are more so output they're easier mm -hmm. right metrics this is yours this is yours way easier but input is where the value is and the hard part is doing it right yeah i think there, there's this this interesting discussion my uh my partner marissa morby has has written about this the the value of outcomes yeah. versus outputs mm. right where like if i write a blog post that is an output. It's an artifact. I've created something. If I write a white paper, if I give a talk, if I host a webinar, if I rewrite a, a doc in the, in the docs pages, each of those things is a unit of work. It's an artifact. It's a piece of output that I've created. What did it do? Yeah. Right. The outcome is what it did. I, you know, got more people to try this product. How? doesn't really matter, but what I, the artifact that led to that outcome was a blog post in this case, yeah. or it was a video, or it was a conference talk, or it was something completely different. But we get so focused on measurable, which mm -hmm. means artifact. I need to be able to weigh what you did yeah. and say you did a good or a bad job because the outcome, right? Like measuring customer sentiment, for example, like I'll give you a really good example that happens all the time in, in developer tooling. Mm. There's a huge tug of war 
over how to shape the conversation around web development, right? Yeah. Each company wants to shape the conversation in a way that leads to people thinking that their tool is the right tool, right? So, you know, if, if you're one of the big cloud providers, you're trying to convince the whole discourse to talk about why going to the cloud is the right call. If you're, if you're selling server racks, obviously you're, you're going the other way. Yeah. Um, and so the, the sort of tug of war here is as someone who works in developer experience or someone who works in developer marketing, your job is to affect the conversation. You are trying to make the way people talk about web development shift. How the hell do you make that a metric? Yeah. Right. You can't. So instead people say, we'll do these SEO uh, articles, but that doesn't matter if nobody's searching for the terms. Right. Yeah. So instead what we need to be looking at is like customer sentiment. You need to be looking at usage of key phrases. You need to be looking at like, what's the message we want people to repeat and how do we make sure that we repeat it enough that it can be something that people pick up and, and say, yeah. right? Cause like repetition is so important when you're trying to change a conversation. And if you look at the way that culture shifts and changes over time, it's not, it's very rarely instant. Mm. It's usually a subgroup of people who has influence over culture, starts using a phrase or a word or a, an idea or a concept. And through repetition, it yep. starts to move out into their concentric rings where it starts to influence more and more people. And then by the time it finally hits, you know, me or my grandparents and we start using that word or phrase, it's no longer cool. And there's another group that's, that's causing that influence. Right. Yeah. But that's the same thing we're trying to do. It's the, the same as, you know, when new slang comes in, we're trying to do the same thing when we're talking about server side rendering, or when we're talking about using react server components, or when we're talking about resumability in apps, like in, if you've never heard any of these terms, don't worry about it. But these are the, these are the sort of things that that we're each group of web developers is trying to convince all the other web developers that that's the right thing. Mm. And if we agree with them and we change our, our worldview to include that as like part of what we're arguing for, we're more likely to use the tools that are built for those things. And so each of these people works for a company and they want you to pay that company because that's how they get a paycheck. Yeah. Right. And we, we can say that they're not marketing, that they're authentic because they're developers, but I mean, come on, we all have to eat. Right. So I don't know. I, I get a little annoyed when people say it's not marketing. It's like, of course it's marketing. <laughs> of you're talking about, you're, you're trying to convince somebody to use a thing. When I tell you to go to my favorite restaurant, I'm selling that restaurant to you. Yeah. Right. When I tell you to use my favorite tool, I'm selling that tool to you. Yeah. It, it doesn't mean that I don't believe in it. It doesn't mean that I'm trying to like shill or it, like con you into using something, but I, I am absolutely trying to change your mind. I'm trying to influence you to go and use the thing that I like. Yeah. Um, it's not a bad thing. No, it's not a bad thing no. at all. That's that's just how humanity works. That's yeah. culture. <laughs> exactly. But I, but it, going back to the metrics thing, can you make culture a metric? Because that's the actual value. That's the outcome you want. You want a team that has the ability to influence culture. And when you see a team that's really good at it, you watch it happen. You mm -hmm. can watch a really effective marketing team or developer relations team or, you know, with, with, you know, more macro things like Apple, Apple will completely change the discussion about what a mobile device should be or what hardware should be present on a computer. Yeah. Um, and then we all talk about it. Like we, and care. then it's obvious. Yeah, yeah. Like who, like which one of us cares about having three camera lenses on our phone, but I guarantee you we're asking about it when we look at the comparison between an iPhone and a, the latest pixel. Yeah. Right. We're looking at like which lenses, which, which thing, but I don't care. No. Give me one good lens and I'm super happy. I don't need the macro and the wide angle and the whatever else is happening. Like one good lens is fine. Mm. That's, it's a phone. I don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but by being very good at influencing the culture, by being good at saying the things that cause other people to pick them up and repeat them we we make that a thing that we have to discuss in a in a much more negative way right now we're watching this with the 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 trans rights stuff mm. where people have repeated it as if it's a problem yeah which it it has not been will continue not to be but enough people are saying it with a high enough level of repetition that people are starting to go wait do we need to worry about this and then they pick up and they start engaging with the conversation which makes it a conversation which allows people to make like actions that were, and we're seeing all this legislation that never would have flown 10 yep. years ago because they were able to influence culture by raising these repetitive arguments that don't make any sense, but were able to influence the conversation. Yeah. Right. So this, this is the sort of thing that like, that's the evil application. The, the positive application is trying to make people's lives easier by convincing them that a thing is worth looking into, you know? And I think that we see that with a little bit of the discussion around 
climate change or around like using better developer tools like hey you don't need to to run your own server in your basement you can use this cloud hosted <laughs> thing or instead of I don't know, instead of configuring Kubernetes yourself, use a tool like Render or Fly that'll do it for you, you know, based on a Git push. Yeah. Those those sorts of conversations, those are, those are a positive application of this cultural shift. We're shifting to serverless. We're shifting to uh, cloud hosted. We're shifting to like config over like building it yourself, yeah. right? Each of those things is what the company wants their team to do. That's the outcome they're after, mm. right? And And, you know, in any of those examples, that's the outcome, whichever person is doing that thing. That's what they're after. Yeah. But that's not the metric they have. No. I guarantee it's not the thing that's going to show up in their performance review. Yeah. And so, and I think that's how all these teams are losing these great, like you have these stellar developer relations teams and they just slowly break apart. Yeah. And I think it's because they're not measuring the right things. They're, they're going to, you know, the Microsoft had this unbelievable developer relations team. Hmm. And it just kind of slowly disintegrated over time. Like okay. they, all of them have left and not for any bad reason. They just kind of all drifted away and moved on to their next adventure. But I would bet that it was because they weren't, they weren't incentivized to do the things that would have gotten outcomes. They were probably measured on, and I don't know this, this is conjecture, sure. but I bet they were measured on things like, you know, how many conference talks did you give? How many badges did you scan at conferences? How many articles did you write? Stuff that's output. Yeah. And it just doesn't matter. No. And nobody was measuring like, hey, did you change the conversation? Like, when did we start thinking Microsoft was a good company again? Mm. We it's all shift. Like, it, you know, if you look back, what, 15 years? Yeah. People, it, Microsoft was a was like a the butt of a joke. Yeah. And all of a sudden it is absolutely the most competitive space to be yeah. right now. Like they're killing it. It's everywhere. Who changed that? Com how did they change that conversation? Well, that's a good one. The interesting thing is like outcome if it happens and it's successful, that's when we know, right? That's when a general population mm -hmm. knows. Apple, Microsoft, they all have had successful outcomes. Mm -hmm. But if that's your metric and it doesn't work, then what is what is wrong there, right? And I was like, maybe maybe we shouldn't measure like output or, or even outcomes, right? Because you're working towards a, a bigger goal. But even from a personal point of view, I want to know if I'm doing well, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm having impact, if I'm even contributing, if I'm working on something which I don't think contributes, I don't want to work on that. But if I still work on something which I think might contribute, I would like some confirmation, some clarification on that, some validation. So measurement, I think from a personal perspective is still valuable, right? You mm. want feedback in the way that you're interacting so you can do better in the future. Also with regards to your work output, yet the hard part is you need a certain vision, right? Because if you're really focusing on outcome, you must have a vision of what you're putting in that will result in that outcome, right? Without a vision, what are you even doing? You're just working on a thing and you hope something might change. Right. Hope is not a strategy, basically. <laughs> yes. And that's the hard part. I think like if people are let go that are working on more more long-term outcomes, because short-term is more easily be, uh, how do you say that? More easily, more easily measurable. <laughs> no, my English escapes me sometimes. But I think for the long term, it's hard, right? Because you really need someone that believes in you. You need an advocate. You need a cheerleader, basically. Someone that believes in what you're doing that will have outcome for the future. Like the most simple uh, example I can use is this podcast, right? Mm. It's super high over and it is marketing, mm -hmm. right? Because my company sponsors it. It's marketing towards the podcast in and of its own, right? It has solid content. That is the um, priority. That is number one. Without solid content, I wouldn't want to do this. Mm -hmm. Yet it is a certain aspect of marketing. But how do you measure it? Like right. listeners, interaction, it all contributes, but does it really? Does it really? People got into this company because they think the content creation side of things and the fact that we're investing in this is really cool. Mm -hmm. That's another metric. Yet that is not necessarily the input that I'm giving, I'm focusing on the quality of the conversations, the content that is actually out there and the, whatever outcome it may be, that might not even be the focus, right? right? I'm just enjoying the ride. And if people are listening, I'm just lucky that they are basically. <laughs> Yet people yeah. find their own metrics and they're like, okay, maybe we should focus on this or maybe we should focus on that. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. In the grand scheme of things with this small type of example, for me, the outcome, it's just, I'm, I'm having fun doing it. Well, and I think, when you when you look at what good marketing is, mm. it's it's the sort of thing that people want to participate in. Yeah, right. Like you you see over you know the last years, 
there are these things that kind of became cultural moments that were advertising, like yeah. traditional advertising. You know, you look at, at, you know, commercials and, uh, for when I was, a, when I was younger, the, the Super Bowl, um, the American football championship is, um, mm -hmm. Like would these commercials would come on yeah. and then people would quote them. I mean, people still quote them 30 years later. Amazing. Right? Yeah. And, and it's, it's these sorts of things that they, they kind of inform and drive culture in a way that, that allows people to have shared cultural connection. You know, yeah. like if, I, I don't know if this one made it across the ocean, but like if I walk up to just about anybody over the age of 30 in the United States and I go, what's up? Like they know exactly what I'm referring to. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And, and it's just the, it's this very interesting thing where you, you want to make something that people want to participate in. Yeah. And the great thing about working in this industry is that we're giving people tools and we can find ways to apply those tools that let people participate. The, the internet is inherently a participatory medium. Yeah. The best way to experience the internet is by putting something into it, right? And we lost a little bit of that when when we moved away from everybody had their own website to more of these these sort of, they're not even walled gardens so much as they are just like common gardens of sure. of Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok where you you go and you use their presentation and their, their, their platform. Yeah. Their platform yeah. and their presentation rules and guidelines. Hmm. You know, when you, when you tweet, you do something different than you would do if you were going to blog. Yeah. And one of the things that, that, but it, I mean, it, it kind of works in both ways. Cause one of the things I really miss is in the, in the early two thousands, when everybody had their own blog, there were really distinct styles, hmm. like it, incredibly diverse ways of blogging that weren't re like, people just did weird stuff and they were kind of into whatever they were into. And it was really fun. And some people would do uh, like custom interaction on their blogs and they would style them up in really silly ways. And it, you know, it was good or bad. Right. But it was different. It was very interesting. And, and that drove people to go look at the yeah. way that the web was being created. Now on Twitter, you can't customize the way that Twitter looks or present. You can't make it more interactive or less interactive, but people are finding ways to abuse the medium of Twitter. <laughs> They still do to, to do things. You know, you see meme formats on Twitter. You see uh, little snippets of language that allow people to kind of riff on a cultural context. And and that to me uh, is is also really, really fascinating. And so what I'm always interested in is how how are the tools that we're using shaping our subculture? Mm. And if if we're working in dev tools, you know, the we we see there are like really culty subcultures and you know, I'm not going to name names or anything, but like you see groups of devs that are very much like use my tool or else you're wrong. Yeah. Uh, and then you see the, the really creative subcultures like uh, this one, I will name names cause it's incredible. But like, if you look at what the GSAP community is doing or mm. what the, like the shaders uh, there's a, this thing called shader toy, which is sort of like code pen for, for WebGL shaders. Okay. And it's just people out there being weird, yeah. like incredibly weird. They're having fun. They're sharing things with each other. They're, it's like one of the places where where people who miss the old web can go be weirdos together, okay. right? CodePen is the same where people go, they build a little thing and they share it with their friends and you can go browse the front page of CodePen and just see CSS experiments and like interesting little things that people are doing. And, and it's just a good spot to go get inspired about what you could do on the web. Yeah. Um, and I, I, what I want to see is... How do we take that, mm. that sort of cultural discussion and turn it into something that actually help? like, how do we get companies to stop trying to get me to attend another webinar, <laughs> right? And, and instead, how do we get them to start thinking about what, like, how do they inform the conversation, influence the conversation, participate in the conversation in a way that doesn't account to like crashing a discord server and just spamming it with links to their next webinar, yeah. right? Because we all... Like, I'm sure that it, it must work or they wouldn't do it, but oh my God, do I, I just, I vastly prefer when somebody from the community works at one of those companies and is just doing cool stuff yeah. and then they invite you to come do cool stuff with them. And, and we've seen really good examples of this where people put together little projects of like, Hey, uh, like, um, Lynn Fisher is one of my favorites in this space because she's always doing experiments with CSS Okay, and she does every year this thing called DivTober where once a day she has a prompt hmm. and she'll make a little CSS illustration around the prompt each day in, in October. Wow. 
And she just invites people to do this with her. And so you get this big collection of people who have some spare time and want to play. And so they all play together and they they use this set of constraints and this, this set of prompts to build art together yeah. on the web. Um, or Hacktoberfest is another good one where uh, it, it's gotten a little a little controversial, but in, in its early days, Hacktoberfest was this thing that DigitalOcean would do yeah. where they encourage people to contribute to open source. And by doing that, you could earn a t-shirt, mm. right? And so it was this, for them, it's a big marketing effort. They're spending, I don't know how much money to print thousands of t-shirts. Yeah. Uh, and they've got to do a bunch of advertising around it and all that, all that they're doing design work and everything. But for the community, you get to go out and build a thing for open source, not for digital ocean. Yeah. And just by participating in open source, which is maybe hopefully something that a lot of developers want to do anyways, oh, I should really get involved. I just don't really know what to do. I don't know how to do my first pull request, whatever it is. Hacktoberfest gives you a great excuse. It gives you a great community support system, uh, an incentive yeah. to go out and do that thing that you were probably already thinking in the back of your mind, I should go and do. And so much goodwill rubbed off on DigitalOcean because of that. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, rightfully so. Also, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, right. They were doing this big thing. Yeah. Um, and like any system, it, it gets a little too big and it starts <laughs> to collapse, and you have to figure out what to do instead. Sure. But how can we do? How do we have more moments like that in our industry instead of you know more advertisements for webinars? Yeah. I and I I feel like that's that's sort of what I'm trying to do with this this new thing is um I'm I'm trying to push us more toward like engaging media. I yeah. don't want to go out and make yet another ad. I don't want to host yet another webinar. I want to make TV. Like, can we make a, a reality TV show about businesses that went online during the pandemic and didn't have a lot of money to do it and their website sucks and they're getting their, their lunch eaten by Amazon and they need someone to come in and help them make their small retail business competitive. Yeah. Right. That sounds like such a fascinating show to me. I would love to watch that. Right. Let's go make that show. I can like I can make that show yeah. if a, if a company wants to do it. Or let's make the Great British Bake Off for nerds. Let's make uh, let's make any any of these things. You know, let's go make a documentary about the best code cities in the world. Right. All of these things are within our reach, and they would do a much better job of driving culture. Yeah. Than another webinar. I agree. You know? And and like, what a conference is going to cost you a million dollars to throw. Hmm. Is anybody going to show up? Is it, it's going to be each company sends their devrels yeah. and they talk to other companies <laughs> devrels and then do like, does anything happen? Are we getting leads anymore? Cause my experience at least was conferences are really good for networking, hmm. but I just wasn't seeing the, the leads. Okay. It wasn't leading to like actual business outcomes anymore other than building relationships with other companies. Yeah really, really good for that. So we do need conferences and I'm sure that there is like, there's an ROI, but it's certainly not what it was in the 2010s. Mm, okay. It's just, it's just not the same. Yeah. So we got to do something different. Right? Exactly. So how do we reach more devs in a more engaging way that they want to be part of? How do we make game of Thrones mm. where every week there's a new episode and people are talking about it and you're driving the cultural discussion. Everybody wants to, Hey, what's going to happen next? Oh, I had this idea. Oh, I'm doing this thing. This is what I, you know, we, we need it to become something that you want to talk about yeah. when the, when the world cup comes on every year, it dominates discussion. Absolutely. Right. Can we do the equivalent of a, a developer web developer world cup yep. where it's a thing everybody looks forward to and it's a big event you watch it with your friends and we all want to discuss what's going to happen and argue about how it went. Like that's just such a fun thing to do. I would love that. Yeah. Right. And we can make it. It's, it's within our reach now. We just need to, we need to start thinking about media and marketing as that sort of thing, as yeah. opposed to, as opposed to like, oh, well, our marketing budget goes towards webinars. It goes towards conference booths. It goes towards whatever it is that we're, we're, you know, paid ads. Yeah. That same budget can go so much further if we get creative with how we apply it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people trend towards more so the established, right? And I think it's, mm. it probably has to do with like innate human beings, basically. Mm. People don't like change anyways. Right. But if we're looking for, because what you've described, right? Companies investing and paying attention, being authentic and engaging through the people that they have mm. with other people and it being resonating, basically, that is a win-win, right? Because a company invests, sure, they have certain certain agenda, they want certain outcomes, but through doing it through their people also, because their people want to do that, they're engaging with the community, that community 
engages back, right? That, mm -hmm. how do you say that? That synergy, their outcome might happen or it might not happen. But the fact that something beautiful happens there is a win-win in and of right. its own, right? You plant a little seed and it might not grow immediately, but at some point you'll have a tree and you'll have a lot to thank for. Because of that, you're looking for win-wins. And those are usually, like there are established win-wins, I guess, but those lie more so on the innovation side of things, more so on the chaotic, right? You're mm. exactly like we mentioned before, you're going from zero to one, right? basically. And it's a hard thing, it's a scary thing, right? Because you need a certain vision, you need to be able to invest and be fine with the risks involved, basically. Mm -hmm. But when it pans out, you have something beautiful in your hands as well. And people talk about it. People know about it. People like that's how you create that that culture shift, I guess. And it doesn't have to be the whole planet that talks about it, right? It right. can be smaller communities. It can be in your city, in your country, maybe even in in your province, I guess, or continent. That was the that was the next step there. <laughs> <laughs> Messed that one up. And that's fine, right? As long as you keep going towards your vision, you measure to some degree, not only on KPIs, I guess, but you keep believing in it. Mm -hmm. I think something will flourish at the end of it. Yeah, I think, you know, we were talking about the kind of concentric circles of culture. And, yeah. and if you think about, you know, the, the smallest concentric circle is your company. Mm. And if you're running a company that has a big marketing budget, does your team feel connected to its marketing at all yeah. because the most important thing again is repetition yeah like are we doing something at our company that everybody understands and believes in and can repeat because they need to repeat it enough that it escapes to that next concentric circle yeah. which is the the close the engaged customers and then to the the casual customers and then to people who aren't customers at all and that sort of discussion that's that's how we drive cultural change yeah but it has to be something that that people can really get excited about. And the way that you make something exciting is you make it fun. Yeah. Right? You got to make it something that people want to participate in and they look forward to. And, you know, you can do this in a lot of different ways. One of the, the things that I saw in it was like 2014 or so is uh, IBM set up this thing called IBM Design. They realized as a company that their ratio of designers to engineers was like criminally low. They had it was way too few designers. Yeah. So they decided they were going to fix this. And so they set up internally, they they redesigned a couple floors of some of their buildings and made them more startup-y, you know, like lots of, like they had a screen printing lab and they had uh, reconfigurable spaces that were full of whiteboards mm. and, you know, bright colors and just something that looked a little less uh, buttoned down than, than IBM was used to. Okay. And they started recruiting into a boot camp. Mm. So college grads, people with no experience, just a lot of potential, they would bring them in for a boot camp and they would pay them yeah. to learn to become UX designers, front end devs, uh, graphic designers. And this created this sort of internal culture at IBM that was so fun. And people were, you know, these, it was basically like kind of, it was sort of a college style culture where these were people who were, you know, they were forming new relationships, friendships that have lasted, you know, 10 years later. I still yeah. know some of these folks hang out. Awesome. Um, and they, they led to things inside of IBM that were bigger than IBM design. So I wasn't part of IBM design. I worked closely with some of those teams. Yeah. But I got to participate in a bunch of those things. And it really changed the way that I thought about IBM because I'd always thought of it as it's big blue. It's mm. very like business consulting. You wear a suit to work. And that was not the IBM that I experienced at all. It yeah. was very much like hoodies and, you know, screen printing. Uh, I, we did posters at one point. And I remember uh, one of my favorite things that I've ever done at a, as part of a job was they did this internal sticker exchange where anybody in the company could sign up to design a sticker. Okay. And then you just printed as many stickers as there were people in the exchange. So it was wow. like 50 people signed up, you print 50 stickers and you, you gave them to the organizers. And then everybody got this little packet of 50 unique stickers that will, they will never be printed again. It no. was just like a fun little thing. You could make it whatever you wanted. So you got this really broad set of stickers yeah. and most of them weren't your style, but it was still really, really fun. Really cool. Yeah. yeah. Those sorts of things, that's what escaped the culture. Like that led to people being interested in working at IBM yeah. who would never have done it before. No. Right. And I think I, I would guess that something similar happened at Microsoft when they saw their big turnaround from being the company that, that people would say like, Oh no, not Microsoft to being the company now where they're like, God, they, they run 
how many dev tools are Microsoft owned? Yeah. Like so it's much incredible. of our stack now, right? GitHub, VS Code, all this stuff is powered by Microsoft. Never would have seen that coming if you had asked me in, in 2008. Yeah. Right around like Windows Vista time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or whenever yeah. that came out. I can't remember. But um, <laughs> like it's it's just very it's fascinating to me that you you start with this internal campaign to change the way people talk about the company. Yeah. And you, you really do have to have a vision that you can be consistent on. And you've got to be really clear on what it is that people should say. And this is really hard for leadership. Incredibly. Because as a leader, you're always getting new context. You're seeing new things come in and you want to adjust and micro optimize. And, oh, well, we should probably clean up the marketing a little bit to deal with market conditions that yeah. shifted. You know, oh, chat GPT is here. Let's rip up the whole roadmap and, and go all in on AI, you know, and and. Nine months ago, we were all ripping up the roadmap to go all in on crypto. And nine <laughs> months before that, we were ripping it up to go in on whatever the last thing was. And and that'll keep happening, right? Yeah. Like there's always going to be an exciting new thing. And I you can find a way to incorporate the exciting new things without completely throwing away everything that you've been working on, right? right? And and to me, that's the really, really tricky part as a leadership team is you have to be willing to say no to so many good ideas yep. to do the one thing that can actually become enough of a culture to escape and and go bigger, right? Yeah. I, I think the kind of the gold standard here is Apple because they're just, you know, kind of revered for their design and advertising. But if you look at each campaign that they run, it's like six plus months mm. of them saying one thing. Yeah. How many things does Apple have? How many products? How many services? How many devices? And each of those devices has how many features? But they just spent a number of months only talking about security, Yeah. right? They could have talked about all sorts of stuff, but they only talked about security. And that was because they wanted to change people's perception of what they needed mm. in a phone and a service, right? And they keep doing that. They're really, really good at this, where they pick yeah. a campaign, they focus down on just the <laughs> one thing that they think can shift the way people talk about mobile devices or about computers or, you know, when they talked about their M1 chips, Apple Silicon, oh, this is built for the laptop yeah. specifically. We own it from, from Silicon to finished product. We built it exactly for you. And everybody kept repeating that. And now everybody's like, well, of course I want the laptop. <laughs> this but is the we thing. I mean, yeah. like, I never would have trusted a no. custom pro of course i was going to go with the intel chip they yeah, yeah. they run everything right yeah. somehow apple did it yeah. they they completely shifted the way that we talk about all this so companies need to look at that mm. apple has way more features and way more products than the average company yeah and they're focusing better than all of us <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and because incredible. of that, they inform the conversation. And like you could say, oh, it's because they throw billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. But like IBM throws millions of dollars at advertising and Everywhere. they have not influenced the conversation at all. They just kind of show a farmer next to a, a big crop machine and say like, you know, I'm I'm able to do more with IBM. And we're like, why? Yeah. <laughs> why would matter? I use IBM? Exactly. I, am, I'm not a farmer. Do I care? Yeah. And then they show another thing and it's it's like somebody in a space suit working with silicon chips. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not that person either. Why do I care? Yeah. And you know that they're big and you know that they do a lot, but you think of them as being for other people. Mm. Apple is focused. They tell you exactly why you individually are going to be better off with this one individual feature. Yeah. And then I'll go do my research on what the rest of the phone does. But oh, I need more security. I don't want. I don't want. Well, what was the thing they were pushing? Like the, don't let apps spy on you. That was their big thing, right? Mm -hmm. So they, you have to like allow apps to track now. Yeah. And that was a that was like a kill stroke. That was genius. Everybody, yeah. right? And all of us went. Oh, of course, I don't want Facebook. Yeah, exactly. Tracking. I'm gonna go don't buy track an me. IPhone. Yeah. <laughs> right. And and we didn't realize that we just you know they changed the conversation. We said I don't want to be tracked. Here, Apple, track me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You do it. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's a weird thing, right? It, there's a lot of facets that go into that, but what Apple offers is a win for someone, right? It's mm. like when you have relationships, I like talking about having an emotional bank account, right? Mm. When someone cancels on you last minute, when someone changes plans, when someone's not really reliable, those are all subtractions from your emotional bank account. And at some point you're like, ah, oh, this person is so much in the negative, I'm not really inviting them anymore. But when someone contributes, right? You have to contribute as a friend within a relationship or as an organization, mm. if someone puts a link to their marketing page or their website, you're like, this is just a link. But if someone engages in that conversation, tries to figure out what your problem is and then solves it with what they offer, mm. that's what Apple does. They change the narrative and they bring the solution. You're like, yes, I want this because the narrative, the thing they've been honing 
and focusing on, that's obviously then the conversation. And then their solution is all of a sudden only the solution you'll see because you'll be like, ah, this is the thing. And, and this is, this is, I think the part where the industry, like the web industry's disdain for marketing yeah. holds us back so much mm. because if, if we look at what Apple's and everybody's like, oh, I want to be Steve Jobs. You know, we've got companies like straight up mimicking Steve Jobs now. Yeah. And they all want to do this until they get to the marketing part. And then like, well, we don't want marketing. We no. want authentic marketing's evil, authentic engineering. Right? <laughs> and then they just say, well, we have the most points of presence. We have the, yeah. we have the most resiliency. We have whatever. And I'm like, okay, well, I've never really had a problem with points of presence. I'm not even hundred percent sure I know <laughs> what, what those are. Yeah. Um, or somebody says like our, our database is like acid compliant. I'm like, you gotta explain it, that. <laughs> is that a thing that do I, do I need to worry about acid now? Like, yeah. <laughs> like the chemical? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they go back and focus on the metrics, right? These right, are, these are right, our right. metrics. But, but if you look at what Apple is doing, hmm. they're saying like this new feature, which is anti-tracking yeah. or this new feature, which is a, uh, higher quality lens on yeah. the camera. They're not going to you and saying, we've got the most megapixels. Yeah. Right. Because nobody like, we nobody all, cares if we it's 18 or 20, <laughs> but there's such a point of diminishing returns on yeah. like number of gigabytes in the phone or number of megapixels in the camera. We all know we want the most, but we don't like, we don't, I don't know. I, if you tell me that you can give me 32 gigabytes versus 64 gigabytes and I start doing the math on how many songs that is. And then I realize that I use Spotify anyway, so I don't need to store songs on my device anymore. Yeah. I'm kind of like, well, sh- where's the edge? I don't need any of this. Yeah. Like I can deal with 16 gigabytes. Like it's all in the cloud. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and so Apple realizes this and they say, okay, we got to market this. Mm-hmm. We got to make this a feature that matters. And they do that by going back and thinking about the problem that they're solving. Yeah. Now, I don't necessarily think that they know what problem they're solving when they start building the feature. I have a, I have a suspicion that Apple, just like every other company out there, is yeah. pumping out features because they feel like they got to pump out features, right? And internally, it's probably complete chaos, but their marketing team is smart. <laughs> So they look at the features that are coming out and they don't just immediately blast it out. Like we got the most megapixels. They go, okay, why would somebody care about a phone? Yeah. Right. Why would somebody care about having better pictures? And then they go and they, they do the, the marketing campaign. I'll tell you who did a great job of this recently was actually uh, Google. Okay. So Google launched the new camera that had a sensor that was actually good at capturing darker skin tones. Yeah. What a narrative. Mm. Holy crap. Like, to take an entire group of people who are used to their cell phone photos being too dark. Yeah. Can't make out who they are. If the light's not perfect, they just kind of fade into the shadows, right? And you tell them, we've got a phone that's going to let you take photos that don't suck. Yeah. They're going to look like you. What a story. Yeah, exactly. Like, and, and, you know, they could have just pumped that out as like better, better color. Yeah. Right. And, and a bad tech company would have mm. a company that doesn't like marketing would have said, we have the truest color spectrum reproduction yeah. on the market. We've compared and everybody everyone. like, we don't care. And yeah. they instead said, what about this whole group of people who's used to their photos sucking? We should go tell them. Yeah. Right. And then all the people who care about that sort of stuff, even if they haven't like, you know, I was like, Oh, maybe I should get a Google phone because they're paying attention to this group of people. Yeah. Right. It's a narrative. They, they managed to tell a story that I cared about. It, it affects me. If I've, if I'm going to take pictures with my friends and my friends have a darker skin tone, I don't want them to hate the photo that I take. Right. All we have to do is work backwards and tell a good story. Yeah. But we go, Oh no, marketing. Ooh, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Like people are used to, I think, linear thinking, and this is more so out of the box, right? With a mm. marketing campaign, you're creating more so a system. Mm-hmm. And then those byproducts you talk about that I want to be mindful of my friends when I take pictures of them, that was never the intent, but that is then the byproduct of this system you've built around whatever you're trying to do. Right. And, and that Google is incredible. Didn't, they didn't tell me that. No. They didn't say like, hey, you person who's never had this problem, think about your friends. But yeah. Because I saw the marketing and then I thought about the fact that like I have taken selfies with friends in bars and like they disappear. Yeah. 
And I'm like, oh, that sucks. I, I wish I was better at taking photos, but it wasn't the photos. It was the sensor, right? Well, Google just told me how to solve that problem. Exactly. Use a sensor that is actually aware of what somebody with brown skin looks like and takes a photo of them instead of optimizing for white skin, which is what most of them do. They're, they're looking for, like they trained on white faces yeah. and that's why they look good. And so Google did the work and then they told me that they did the work and now I can make a choice to do something better. Yeah. Right. And it's, it's such a brilliant way of approaching the problem. And they didn't like, it didn't change the way they did engineering. No, nope. I'm sure that somebody was thinking about this, like in, and pitched it in product is like, Hey, we should get better at this. So I don't yeah. want to take away that, that work. But on the marketing side, if we discount that effort, if we discount the story that we're telling and instead we just go for the features, yeah. which is what I think so many of us do. That's why we go to webinars. Come learn about how we get the most rows of data per second or whatever it is. And mm. I don't care, <laughs> right? Unless I have that very specific problem, which is honestly why I think so many of these companies are, are doing a million webinars. They do a ultra feature specific webinar yeah. to catch the 30 people who have that ultra specific problem at that exact moment in time. Yeah. And that works. Like if you are currently in the process of micro optimizing your database because you're seeing bottlenecks, you're going to be looking for the company that's advertising, you know, the optimizing solution. your database yeah. for bottlenecks. You're going to, Oh, perfect. That's what I need. But so many of us would benefit from that, but we don't know it's our problem. Yep. So if instead you can tell me a story that helps me understand where I am and I go, oh, I see myself in this story. And then they say, and then this thing happens and you don't like it. And you go, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> you go, and you can solve it by doing X, Y, Z. And you go, okay, yeah, I'm ready to me. do that. And they go, great, we'll help you. Yeah. you go, Perfect. I don't know how to do it. I'm going to call you. It's And it's it's not really that different from saying we can do the most rights per second. Yeah. It's just taking that moment to contextualize it and not getting feeling icky because we're telling somebody a story about themselves and go, oh, well, we don't market. We just talk about features. Yeah. There's, there's, there's so much potential here to just be thoughtful, be intentional to, to think about who we're trying to help and then just be patient enough to write a story about how we're actually helping them instead of just saying like, well, you're smart, you're an engineer, you'll figure out what this esoteric set of features means. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, Looking back on products, right? It's been a while since a new product launched and you're like, okay, this is truly innovative. Now it's more of the same, more features, mm -hmm. but the things that stand out are the ones that have that narrative, right? Right. Stories are things people remember. That's just it. If there's no story behind it, then you have a bunch of metrics mm -hmm. which don't really resonate. So the thing you have to focus on then, even if you're a technical company, right? You have probably a bunch of competitors, unless you're truly in an innovative space, but that's really hard. Mm -hmm. Then you have to establish yourself. What is the difference, right? What makes us more unique? And if you focus on the numbers, they're going to be like, well, what's the difference, right? What's the difference between a six and a five or a 60 and a 55? People mm -hmm. don't really care, mm -hmm. right? At some point they'll be like, oh, it's the same. I'll go with the cheaper option. Right. But if there's a narrative behind that, why that 60 is better than that 55, people will be like, yes, because that's what we're aiming for, right? That solves my problem. I can see it. I believe it. This is what we need. Right. And that is where your difference will be. And and this can happen in a way that's not even like very polished marketing. I'll give you a yeah. super concrete example of a time that I willingly parted with double the money mm. for no reason. Okay. <laughs> I was looking for microphones, yeah. right? And I had looked up the specs on these different microphones and, and you know, there was this one that was USB powered. It was going to be great. It did everything that I needed. And then there was this other one that was XLR powered and it required this extra device I had to plug into and I needed all this extra gear to make it sound good. And I watched a YouTube review mm. and somebody just told me, like, okay, well, this is me talking into this mic. Yeah. And you hear how good my voice sounds? Okay, now this is me talking to the other cheaper mic. And it sounded thin. And I was like, oh, I don't want to sound like that. <laughs> right? And it, Genius. It's just this little thing, yeah. right? And and it made a human connection to me because when I was looking at the specs of the mic, yeah. I don't know about dynamic range or high pass filters or like I, I academically, I understand them. But I'll tell you what I can't do is translate those specs into what it sounds like. Yeah. Right. And so the, in the same way that watching a mic review on on YouTube is going to really drastically influence what I choose for a microphone, because I want the best sounding one I can afford. And if I can hear people speaking into all the same mics that I'm looking at right now and I go, OK, this is the one that's the most money I can afford to spend. Yeah. And it really doesn't sound better than this one that's two thirds of the money. I'm going to buy that one. 
or you're going to hear a real difference and you go, okay, well that one is worth the money because it's you, it's like, listen, yeah, right. And I think the same thing happens with with dev tools. And it's one of the reasons that I'm I'm steering more into video mm. is that when I read, you know, if you read a tutorial, typically what you'll see in a tutorial is the the polished outcome. Like everything went right in a written tutorial. Yeah. And in a live stream, you don't get any of that. You get the really rough, like, okay, I'm I'm logging into the service. I click this button. I don't know what do I click? Where's the menu? Well, you see these struggles, right? And you can really feel the difference in a polished product that's really going to solve the problem I have versus one that I'm kind of wrestling into submission to do what I need it to do. Yeah. And you can make videos mm. that, that are polished that have that same sense of like, okay, well, here's me speaking into the good mic and yeah. here's me speaking into the one that doesn't do what I need it to do. We can get that same sense of like, oh my goodness, this is so much better when we watch somebody demonstrate tools in an authentic way. Yeah but with a little more intentionality around the story you're trying to tell. Like yeah. I, I can't just, you know, give you the, if everybody just does the getting started, it's not a comparison. I no. can't look at, you know, the getting started of this tool and the getting started of this tool, which are completely different and say, well, this one <laughs> clearly feels better than the other one. Yeah. Like, well, no, it's this one enough. had better writers than this one, but that yeah. doesn't really help me. I want to build the same project with a couple tools and, and feel that difference. And, you know, that's one of the things I love so much about the the job I'm doing now is that that kind of is what I'm doing most of the time. Yeah. Um, but I, th I feel like companies should steer more into this and, and really start to, you know, why do people watch hundreds of hours of YouTube around niche interests? Why yeah. are people watching like 12 sided die comparisons? They really like there's no way there's no way that there is a difference between 12 sided die, as long as they're the right shape, <laughs> yeah. I have to believe that, Call but it. I know I'm wrong. Yeah. I know if I got into that, somebody's going to tell me that the composite material of this one <laughs> is better than whatever it is. And I'm going to buy it. I'm yeah, going to yeah. end up getting that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, this is the world we live in now We're we're watching TikTok, we're watching YouTube We're we're really, we're <laughs> relying on other people to tell stories. Mm. And we rely on the the high dollar amount stories like the Apple advertisements. And we rely on the zero dollar stories like somebody talking into a microphone. Yeah. But we have to be ready to tell those stories. We can't keep running the same playbook that worked in, in 2005 because it's just not, it's just, the world shifted. We're just not there anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it has to do with a lot of things. I feel like, like if I look back at what I own. I'm a very simplistic kind of guy. I don't own a lot of stuff, but the things I own, I hold a lot of value in, mm -hmm. not because of the price I paid. Some of them are really cheap even. Mm -hmm. I have a water bottle, but it has traveled to countries with me. And I'm very fond of that bottle because of that, right? Mm -hmm. I don't listen to a lot of music, but the music I listen to are Japanese songs because I used to watch anime. Those songs came back ah. in there and they remind me of a certain time period, of a mm -hmm. certain way they made me feel. And if I have you listened to them? You can be like, what the hell is this? <laughs> or even friends of mine, they don't, they don't understand, nor will they, right? It's my personal experience with this kind of thing. And with the tool we're using or tools we're using, it could be the same, right? It could mm. be the first thing someone taught me when I got into my first developer job, right? Or in operations, these were always the things we used. So I hold value in them because of that, right? I have a relationship. Right. I have a sense of trust with them. And to change that narrative, to do it consciously, mm -hmm. first of all, very hard, but secondly, it's going to be very powerful. The only reason you got that microphone and you remember that story is because someone told it, right? You didn't make that up. Exactly. Yeah. And so much of our experience now depends on stories. There's so much more information than we can ever actually assess, yeah. right? So we're relying on recommendations. We're relying on people that we trust. And typically we don't have subject matter experts as close friends. So we rely on proxies, we rely on experts. And that's why we see in the web development community, this sort of inner circle of, of like respected experts that kind of make the call on how the conversation goes. Yeah. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it can be a bad thing, mm. but generally speaking, we're outsourcing our trust because I don't have a good friend who owns all the microphones and can let me try them. Yeah. Um, and not everybody has a, a good friend who works in, in web dev who can show them how all these tools work. Yeah. Right. And that is the space that we can kind of fill as companies is like go out and work with the same way that these microphone companies 
are absolutely sending microphones to these YouTubers and yeah. saying like, hey, here's a microphone. Can you can you try it out and yeah, say what you like it? about yeah. it, what you don't like about it? And I don't think that reviews are going to work really well mm. in in web dev, but I think build alongs will. Yeah. And, and I, I don't think I know I'm watching it happen. Right. There's there's a there's a lot of space for just relying on people who have put the time in to learn how to tell stories. And a lot of times that story is, I like to build stuff, come build with me. That's the story I tell, <laughs> right? But people are willing to show up and learn what I'm working on. Mm. And I think that it's a good way for somebody who's not like actively solving a problem to not have to go and and do all of this research and set up on their own. They can just kind of skim over what's happening in the, the web dev landscape so they at least have an awareness of what's going yeah. on. Um, that's a lot of what I do with a, with a lot of my like microphone and camera consumption. I'm not actively shopping for cameras, but I kind of want to know what's going on in the space because I, I do know that there's a period, probably six months in the future where I'm going to do a bit of an overhaul to my studio mm. and I don't want to have to start at zero. Yeah. So I'm just casually consuming information about cameras, you know, a few minutes here or there. Um, and with web dev, I think we all kind of do the same thing and it depends on, you know, if, if your only source of information is say Twitter. Yeah you're getting a very particular flavor of information versus if your only source is TikTok or YouTube or RSS feeds or just the, the issue log on the spec, mm -hmm. right there. So we need to meet people where they are yeah. and not, if you don't like that, everybody is learning about their tech on YouTube and you feel like it's not an accurate representation don't try to get people to stop watching YouTube. Just put an accurate representation on YouTube. Yeah. Like just find somebody that you like and, and have them make that content, you know, hire them or contract them, whatever it is. But you, we can't, we can't keep pretending that the, the same things that used to work are going to keep working. We, we got to just kind of look at this new space and go, all right, this is what the world is. Yeah. How can we tell a better story in it? How can we, you know, we're, we're not going to get people to stop telling stories. We're not going to get people to stop trying to convince all their friends to use the tools they like. So how do we become part of that conversation in a meaningful way as opposed to just being sad about it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one of the, one of the final thoughts I had, and it, it zooms in on one of the things you mentioned is that I've seen you do a lot of live streams, you mm -hmm. do a, a lot of things live, right? Programming. Now, I love pair programming myself with other people, with my colleagues, because I don't really care that they see that I make mistakes, mm -hmm. right? Or, they can learn from my workflow. I can learn from their workflow, their kind of thought process. I think it's very valuable to do so, but to do that on a bigger scale for me and probably for some listeners can seem kind of frightening, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're allowing a lot of people insights in your workflow, also the mistakes in there, the imperfections in there, and it can be frightening to do so. Yet I see you're having a ton of fun with it. You're <laughs> being successful with it. It's very enjoyable to watch and it's educational, right? The value mm -hmm. that you add there is valuable just by virtue of the amount of people watching, right? And they don't have to be even actively developing right, right now. They could just be touching base with whatever they need for the knowledge aspect, just like you are with cameras and microphones. How do you do that, man? Because how, it sounds frightening to me, like I do it with a one-on-one -on -one kind of relationship. It's a bit more intimate maybe, but the scale of which you operate is impressive to me. I, I think it is a, it's a, it's a learned skill, right? Mm. It's, it's practice. So my background I, I mentioned earlier was in music. Yeah. And one of the things that we used to do is, is we toured heavily. We played about 200 shows a year for, for a few years there. And every single show we set up a camera in the back yeah. and then we'd sit in the van and we would watch our performance and make notes about what we did well and what we didn't like. And I would never dance like that again or whatever it is. Right. Um, and so I got used to seeing myself on camera, which I think was, you know, that it takes time. You have to learn to listen to your own voice and not cringe. You have to learn to see your own face on camera and not feel like it's somebody else. And yeah. so I, I got a lot of practice when I was a musician of sort of seeing myself in a performance setting. Okay. I also have always really enjoyed performance. Um, I, I like working with a crowd. I like that, that sort of interactivity of, of being with a group of people. And, and I also, you know, I'm a ham. I like being the center of attention. Mm. So it's fun for me to do these performances. And, and that's something that, you know, I, I started doing live performances as a musician when I was around 14 or 15. Yeah. And I did that until I was in my early twenties. And then, you know, I started public speaking in, in, uh, my 
mid early mid twenties. Mm. And I've just kind of always been in some form of capacity of being in front of people. Nice. Um, the other thing is, is just finding systems that are repetitive mm. so that I don't have to make it all up on the go. Um, I, you know, what makes a conference or what makes a concert work is having a set list. What makes a conference talk work is having a slide deck and having written something. And what makes my live streams work is that I have a format. Mm. So every show, if you watch it, I have a few things that I'll say verbatim and a, a few segments that I use every single time. Yeah. And I do that to give me some structure and some touch points. If I feel like the show's going off the rails, I can move it to another segment and kind of recenter everything and, and get it back on track. Um, and then I think the, the other big thing is just you, something that you learn as a performer through doing it over and over and over again is that mistakes are really only visible if you stop to dwell on them. Cause I'm constantly screwing up on the show and sometimes I'll, I'll point it out and I will like make a joke out of it or yeah. make it a teachable moment. Like I just made a really common bug. Let's talk about what I did and why, uh, or most of the time. I don't mention it. I just fix it and keep moving. Yeah. Right. And, and oftentimes when people are watching, they're not, they're not watching to like nitpick you. People are in your corner. Nobody, you have to be a pretty high level of, of <laughs> creator before you get people hate watching you. Yeah. Right. On average, especially earlier in your career, people are watching because they think you have something to offer and they, they're pulling for you. They're in your corner. Yeah. Right. And until you give them a reason not to be, They'll remain in your corner. Mm. Um, and so what, what I'm usually trying to do, and this is why a big focus for me is like, I don't bash tech. Uh, I shut it down. If it happens in the chat, I am always talking about these things as tools. We're yeah. here to solve problems and we've got a big toolbox and any one of them is valid if it's being used in the right application. Mm. Right. And so there's not, there's not a, a right or a wrong way to build for the web. There are just different ways to build for the web and all of them are good you know, in to, their own to right. varying degrees of effective, yeah. but it doesn't matter. Like it, who cares? None of this, we're just moving dots on a screen. Like it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. right? So we can just have fun with this. And, and so that's been a really big focus for me is it, it's not that serious. These aren't life or death decisions. You can build a great career, whether you're writing Java, Ruby, PHP, JavaScript, whatever you want, it yeah. doesn't matter. There's money out there. There's success and, and happiness for all of us if we're willing to go out and get it. And fighting over the tools or, or worrying about whether we're using the right stack or whatever it is, it, it just, it just doesn't matter. Like that's all stuff that brings you down. Yeah. And so I focus very heavily on the, the building part. Like mm -hmm. my job is, is, uh, I, I've recently started, you know, my, my mantra here is like, we're here to learn, grow and build together. Yeah. Right. That's the plan. And if we're doing any of those things, it's a great show even if we don't even get the thing working. Like we've had shows where, where we get to the end of the stream and I'm like, well, this was a, this one maybe <laughs> didn't go the way we want. So, uh, you know, we'll post a working version later when we figure out whatever the heck we're doing wrong. Here. Uh, incredible. <laughs> and that's okay because the, the, I, the intention was to, to learn and we learned, don't do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That is, it's incredible because I, I see the joy you have in there. It's very conscious, right? You want to build people up from the ground up or midway up, doesn't really matter. The thing is it's it's positive, right? And any negativity with regards to the tools or even preferences you have, shut that down, right? That's not what you're here for, basically. Right. You're here for a, a how do you say that? A certain journey, a learning journey, and you're doing it together. Yeah, and and I think, you know, one one important caveat, I think, is is this isn't positivity with like a no, hmm. with like no room for, for disagreement or anything. Yeah. Because criticism is fine. You can always talk about the strengths and weaknesses of something. Um, and I do think that there's a there's a toxic positivity where you you go so far in one direction that like you can't acknowledge that anything's ever bad and you're just yeah. pretending it's all fine. <laughs> That's not what we're after here. What Good. we're after is is recognizing that like all of this stuff is a big wave, hmm. right? And and if we try to control it, if we try to get it exactly right, if we're trying to be perfect. It, you can't do that. It's like trying to, you know, squeeze water. You, you have to be gentle. You have to cup your hands. You got to surf the wave. Yeah. Right. And it's, it, it's always going to be moving. It's always going to be adjusting. The things that are true today will not be true in a few years because technology will advance. There's no done in a technology space. There's no done ever. Nope. Right. You never finish. You're just adjusting as you go. And so the, the biggest career hack, the biggest happiness hack that I've ever learned 
is to enjoy the journey. You, you, you're learning because it's fun to learn. You're building because it's fun to see something emerge from nothing. You're, you're doing web dev because it's great to get paid for something that's kind of enjoyable. I like doing puzzles. This is a puzzle I can get paid for. Yeah. Right. And if we can really embrace that and embrace that we're not going toward a destination, we're just trying to have a good time for as long as we're here. That makes this whole thing way less stressful and way more fun. And it's just so much easier to be around people who approach it that way, right? Like we're not looking at a winner take all scenario. There will be no ultimate winner of the internet, (laughs) right? And if there is, that's the only way we lose. Yeah. So instead let's embrace all these tools, all these people, let's try them all. Let's have some fun. And sure. We'll all end up with the things that we prefer. And I've got a stack that I'll reach for if I'm building on my own, but Never going to say, oh, no, no, thank you. I would, I'm done learning. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the end, probably. Right, yeah, yeah, I think I, for me, that is. That's, that's the, the end of learning is, is the end of everything. Yeah. Like if, if I feel at any point that I've hit, the, I don't know, the, the pinnacle of learning, oh, I know everything I'm ever going to know. Like that's it for what me. What are you doing I, then? Yeah, yeah, then what? I just that's sit it. quietly until I die? That sounds terrible. Yeah. <laughs> You'll know what to do when you reach that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, I've I've really enjoyed this conversation. To be honest, like I get little cues when we're about 45 minutes in. Those have long gone. Like, <laughs> this is I'm this so is sorry. probably the yeah. longest episode. No, no, no. It it was a really enjoyable ride. This is also coincidentally, and I didn't tell you this. This is episode 100. So oh, cool. this is uh, going to be our 100th episode and it's also been quite a journey. Like you mentioning how you're getting more comfortable with seeing yourself progress and be on mm. stage and listening to your own voice. Yeah, hopefully, uh, no, actually, hopefully it's already gone. I, I still look at myself and I'm like, man, I look sleepy, but I'm like, I look sleepy in every episode. So it should be, <laughs> should be uh, a permanent thing by now, I guess. No, this has been a lot of fun, man. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was a blast. Yeah, awesome. I'm really happy you were just in the neighborhood, I guess. Yeah, it worked it's out. really cool. So <laughs> we're, uh, we're going to round it off. If you're still listening, check out Jason's stuff. I'm going to put all his socials in the description below. Let him know you came from our show. And again, thank you for listening. This is the 100th episode. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next one.